Our gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel according to Matthew as we continue to hear verses from what we usually refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. This reading begins in chapter 5 at verse 38 and is on page 5 in the New Testament part of your Bible. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Two weeks ago, we talked about foundations particularly the foundation for our faith life. I don't suppose that any of us was surprised to learn that the scriptures are pretty clear. The foundation for our faith life is a gift from God, a gift given through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the one whom we acknowledge as Lord and Savior. Today, we're going to talk about buildings. The kinds of lives we put up on this foundation of our faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to his friends in the Corinthian church, makes it plain, once again, that the foundation is Jesus Christ. That Paul helped begin the building of their lives and that others came along and added to that growth. And he finishes the argument by asserting that we are these buildings, God's buildings, and that we are holy. Now, I suspect that no one wants to argue these propositions, but we might, and very likely, have a pretty lively discussion about what kind of building is to be built. What does it mean that we are holy? Perhaps we don't see ourselves as holy. Are we all to be alike somehow in this holiness? Holiness, surely not. How can we know that we are shaping our lives in the form that God wants? Well, first of all, We do not have to become holy in order to earn God's love. God's love for us is first and foremost. One commentator describes holiness this way. Holiness is not characterized by an ethereal state of being, but by how one acts in everyday places and relationships. Holiness is not about making grand sacrifices to God or speaking pious prayers. Holiness is living as God's redeemed people. But still, we might well ask, what does holiness look like? Well, there are lots of ways that we could propose an answer. For this morning, I would like to propose that the life and lives we are building in answer to the holiness question, whether it's our individual personal life of discipleship or the corporate life of this congregation, that this building we're working on is to be cruciform in shape. Now, to be cruciform is to be shaped like a cross. 
which first requires a vertical and upright. To speak in metaphor, this vertical is our relationship with God, the part of our lives in which we are stretched up and out, up and out, lifted above ourselves to that which God designs for us to be. Now, we learn this in Scripture. Scripture rooted deeply in the heart of the Old Testament first. You shall have no other gods than the Lord God. You shall not have any idols. You shall not make wrong use of God's name. And you shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Verses from Exodus and Deuteronomy. And so it was that when Jesus was asked which of the commandments was the greatest in a clear attempt to trick him and trip him, he quoted this last passage from Deuteronomy as the heart of the Jewish law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Our lives are rooted in God. This is our vertical first and foremost. But a vertical will fall over if it does not have a horizontal with which to balance it. And so we see in the heart of the Old Testament again and from Jesus again the horizontal part of our lives, the part in which we stretch out and help and serve one another. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And do not covet. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Exodus and Leviticus. Followed by Jesus. And a second commandment. This is after the first and foremost one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now for today, I'd like for us to think more about this horizontal part of our lives, how we're building our lives in such a way that they indeed reflect these foundational aspects of our faith. Now I suspect that if led to our own resources and our own decisions, we would not read from the book of Leviticus much. But we're not going to be very old before someone quotes to us, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We may not even know that's from Leviticus originally. But we hear it from our Sunday school teacher. Our teacher at school may even quote it one day. And then the playground supervisor throws it out when folks are not playing nicely with one another. We call it the golden rule. It interests me how widespread this instruction is among the world's religions. You can try this this afternoon. Just Google Golden Rule. It's amazing what you'll get. Lessons from Islam, Jainism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and a traditional African proverb, which I'll tell you in a minute. And of course, Judaism, not to mention Christianity. In Confucianism, we find this. Try to Try your best to treat others as you wish to be treated yourself. You will find that this is the shortest way to benevolence. Sounds pretty good to me. Here's the African uh, quote uh, attributed to traditional African folklore in Nigeria. I don't know whether this is true or not, but that's what it said on the internet. But I liked it. One going to take a pointed stick to pinch a baby bird, don't know why one would do that, should first try it on himself to see how it hurts. <laughs> uh, we got it. We got it. So, if we're interested in building this kind of life, what tools do we have to help this building. 
Well, first of all, of course, in this place we have worship. Our worship which nourishes, nourishes our vertical as well as our horizontal. Now, in this congregation, hospitality and welcoming are important. Not just important, we say, by our words, but practiced. People like to come here. They feel welcomed. Another tool is our new hymnal. Presbyterians all over the country are using them, actually beginning, I'll just have to say, feeling kind of proud of our new book. It is being bought and used, surprise, surprise, in record numbers. And many other Christian groups besides Presbyterians are finding it to be a great aid in worship. The way the book's songs are organized actually reminds us of this cruciform shape. A book that you all never used. You didn't miss anything, but I'll just tell you this. Uh, all the songs were in alphabetical order. Well, there's a logic to that. As the publisher says, you know, that's just great. But it wasn't very useful because you never could find all the ones about Lent in the same place. The blue book, which we've just <laughs> given up, began with the church year. And so the first hymn was, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, the beginning of our search. But this book is organized differently. It first of all reminds us to praise God, lifting us up. Hymn number one, this will be on the test. Hymn number one, holy, holy, holy. Lifting up old traditional song, lifting up uh, us up to praise God, almighty, merciful, perfect in power, love, and purity. And then there's number 853, the last song. We're marching in the light of God. One of the things I like about this new book is at the bottom of every page, it tells a little bit about the origin of where that song came from. I've learned a lot, and I know a lot of songs. We Are Marching in the Light of God was first translated into English in 1984. Comes to us from a Methodist men's group in South Africa. The origins of this song stretch us out into the worldwide church. Its music has a rhythm and a beat and words that lead us out into the world as children of God. Now, a song book's only a tool an important tool, but it's a tool to aid us in worship. But I'm beginning to have some favor for this new songbook. I think it will become loved and hopefully well used, a good tool as we sing praise to God and sing about our discipleship. But we have lots of other tools. We have this building. We have our programs. We have money. We have one another. We have time. So the question is, how shall we use them? How can we be the people of God and the congregation God wants us to be? We often welcome outside groups who find this building a good place to meet. We not only say we think young people are important, but we do things that support them. They lead worship, and we're grateful for that leadership and their message. We say that mission is important. You know, a certain percentage of our money automatically goes to support Presbyterian mission work in our country and around the world. We give to mo local mission causes. We like uh, to support all kinds of work of groups in this country, and we're exploring ideas that will help us be in partnership with a group someplace else in the world. Sometimes, especially in a transition time, I hear folks talk kind of wistfully about another program that another church does as if we were failing in our job. Well, we may be failing, but we may not. Our job is to be the congregation God wants us to be. 
Now, the foundation, of course, for all Christian communities is Jesus Christ. But there's got to be a building on that foundation. But the building we're called to build is not like any other building. So the question is not whether we're going to build or not, but what is God leading us to build? Thinking and working about our building. There's also Sunday school, midweek studies, a prayer vigil, and oh, by the way, you see those index cards on your pew and you wondered what you're supposed to do with those and you thought they were just left over from something? Mm -mm. If you have a specific prayer request that you would like for people to pray over during the vigil, write that down. You don't have to sign your name. Just write it down. Put it in the offering plate. They'll be collected and made available to those who come and pray. Following the prayer vigil, there may even become the establishment of a weekly prayer group. Following all of that, there are, of course, all kinds of outreach opportunities. Searching for the new one, not to mention, of course, or forget to mention, that new pastor that will come and be your partner in all of this. Once upon a time, the Apostle Paul wrote to a congregation young in years but eager to share the gospel. He said, we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid that foundation is Jesus Christ. Are you not excited to see how all of this is going to turn out? 